Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 404, featuring the uh, fifth and final installment of my interview with the great Steve Ince. In this part of the interview, we talk about uh, the Witcher series, uh, Steve's work on that, the stuff he was doing with the script to uh, make it sound more authentically British. Uh, we also talk about uh, dealing with feedback and the criticism and the trolls and sort of how to mine that for... Uh, useful stuff. Uh, we talk about consulting, or Steve's consulting business. Uh, we talk about first-person games like Myst versus third-person games like Broken Sword or uh, Monkey Island, the pros and cons of that, and uh, much, much more. There's quite, actually quite a bit of uh, content here that I think you'll really enjoy. Anyway, we've got a lot to cover, so without further ado, here is Mr. Steve Ince. Get that next. Uh, just a couple last questions here. Yeah, That's sure. Oh, let's see. Oh, so one of the things I wanted to ask about was your involvement with the, the Witcher series, uh, simply because it has so many fans of those games so that, that watch this show, so I'm sure they love anything you can say about yeah. it. Yeah. Mm. Well, there's a funny funny story to this. Um, they, the people involved wanted me to work on the dialogue um, with them. But I was in the middle of, I think I was in the middle of So Blonde at the time, and I couldn't afford the time. So I actually worked with them to find another another writer to to work with them. And I did this. They, they sent me some samples, and I gave critiques of these samples you know, from these other writers. And I didn't know who they were because they'd sent me them to me blind, so I, I didn't know who, who'd done them. Um, I said, oh, I like this one. I think this one is a bit Rubbish. too formal, you know, <laughs> and, and, and so on. Um, you know, I was trying to be fair, you know, and, and they chose the writer based on that. And then they come, you know, sort of like about six or eight months later, they came back to me and said, we've got 100,000 words and we need, it's too many. We need it editing down to about 60,000 because we've still got more to go in. So although all this, all this, dialogue had been written um they decided that it was too much so <laughs> so in a very short space of time i think it was something like 12 days i had to edit 100,000 words down to 60,000 and it was like oh and and so it probably wasn't my best work because of the, the short time frame that i had um you just ran out of money for the voice voice acting, I guess. It was just storage. I don't know. I maybe just felt it was a bit too, it's much. too much. But they, you know, sort of, um, and it was really hard because there was an awful lot of short lines, and it's difficult, you know, when somebody goes, "Hey, you," you know, what what do you do? But go edit that to "Hey," <laughs> <laughs> which which kind of changes the tone a bit. Um, so so it was quite difficult, you know, um, not only time wise, but. But um, I don't know. I, I just feel as though that you know, if I'd have been given more time, I'd have I'd have done a little bit of a better job on it. But then the the second Witcher game, um, w all the dialogue I think was written in in Polish, and then translated into English, and they wanted me to go over, um, go over it, kind of like giving it a, a, a proper script edit, just just to make sure it flowed properly and to make sure that, it, you know, it sounded like things people who spoke English would say, you know. So so, so that was a little bit less involved, but the quality was much better to start with. Yeah, I definitely um, noticed a the jump translation between the was, first and the second one. You know, in terms of just so, the, yeah. the flow of it. Yeah. I think, I think they were still learning an awful lot when they did when they did the first one. I think it was an ambitious project for a relatively young team or, or new studio and that. And I think they did fantastic, um, a fantastic job considering. Um, but obviously by the second one, they'd, they'd, they'd learned an awful lot. They, they approached it in a, in a much better way uh, and more organized and so on. Um, and so, so I think that, that 
that ultimately showed in in the final product. Well, we've certainly been successful with that <laughs> Witcher series. Mm. Oh, definitely yes, and I think it, part of that is is the way that they've created these these characters in the worlds and, and everything, and you know, sort of like it just seems to kind of all nicely stick together, doesn't it? And it's quite dark, and you know, sort of like a lot of I think a lot of RPGs have a kind of like surface darkness, but don't have a deeper darkness that that perhaps The Witcher does, and I think that 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 comes through. I think it has has that depth. That, that a lot of a lot of game stories just don't have. Well, one other thing we I kind of skipped it when we were earlier, but I wanted to ask about was that we were talking about third person games and the characters and everything. You know, I noticed that you seem to prefer that uh, person. I guess <laughs> I don't <laughs> not sure that you've done first person games like Mist or, or Riven. No, you know, no. Is there just, you're just no interest in that, or is it just? Um, I couldn't get into Mist. I must admit, or that style of game. Um, I know that a lot of people love them for the puzzles, and it's not about the puzzles that, that I dis oh, dislike them. Is is wrong? But you know, I can't get into them. It, it's the fact that the worlds seem empty. There are no characters to interact with. And, um, you know, it kind of feels as though you're, you're walking around a ghost world. Mm. And and I just like character interaction. You know, I like um, I like George talking to Nico in Broken Sword. I like, you know, Manny talking to... Oh, I've forgotten the woman's name now. But, you know, sort of at the beginning there when, she, when he's talking to the woman behind the desk and, and, and she's saying... And, you know, kind of like, I'm not your secretary, you know, and, and all this kind of stuff. I just love that character interaction. And and to me, it's, it's you know, it's, it, they, you know, good character interaction sets up the, the you know, the story, the, the, the goals of the, of the protagonist and, you know, and justifies the, the puzzles that, that the player's got to solve. Whereas something like Mist to me is just about the puzzles. You know the, the the rendering of those those scenes. I mean, particularly in the first one, when when you know, kind of all this was very new, you know, and and it was fantastic to look at, but it just just felt a bit cold to me because there were no characters, and so I just couldn't get into that. So I totally get what you're saying. I mean, I always felt to me kind of like the it's an amusement park, but it's all empty. It's like an abandoned. Amusement yeah. park, and you're there trying to figure out, like, well, where did the people go? <laughs> yes. Uh, versus we, we, all these other adventure games where you're, it feels like a like the Monkey Island games, you know, they always felt very <laughs> sort of alive to me. Yeah. I think the, you know, kind of like when you've got characters and when you're talking to characters and you're moving about the world trying to solve the story that's that's happening, you feel as though you're in the story. The trouble with a lot of first-person games is that you're often uncovering a story that's happened in the past. Um, you know, you kind of like you investigate in this this abandoned world of you know in, in some way, and it, you're finding clues like you know kind of it might be tape recordings, it might be diary entries, and you know letters from a solicitor and all this kind of stuff. But it's all stuff that's that's already happened. You know, you you're whoever you are playing, it's not happening to you. It's not a story that's happening to you. It's something that's already happened in the past. And and that, to me, pushes me away from the story a bit. You know, and... I'd, you know, so like, there are first-person games where you feel as though you are part of the story. But I think that, that you know, there's a lot of adventures and a lot of games in general that of th thrust you into a, a very cold empty world i mean you know sort of like recently there was um everyone's gone to the rapture which felt a bit like that that you weren't really that the story wasn't happening in the present and then what is it is it gone home what was, was similar am i thinking of the right one but you know sort of like there is a number of you know games that that in many respects, there's nothing wrong with them, 
but for me, I just don't feel the same connection to the story when it's already happened in the past. Yeah, I know what you're saying. I think it works. One of the games I think where it worked well was uh, uh, Scratches. Have you ever played that one? Augustine I played some of it, yes. Yeah, that's just like, thing. That's, that's a it's, creepy it's game. It's a horror game, so it kind of worked that you're kind of feeling lonely and <laughs> alone. Yeah, but, but that, had, that had a presence of... In, 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 rather, that had things going on in the present, didn't it? You know the, the scares, the you know the exploration. You know was very much in the in the here and now. You know even though you were you were maybe kind of like discovering a story that that had happened, there was still thing you, you f- still felt that that kind of immediacy, and I think that that worked. So that managed to combine, I think, the the, the past and the present. It, it, you know, sort of, and, and I, th- I I think that that is when it works better. You know, it's kind of like when you're going through a story now that relates to a story that happened in the past, you know, and then, then, then you connect the two. But I think too many, too many just rely on uncovering this past story on its own without, without that connectivity. I'm, I'm trying to imagine what a broken sword game would have been like from a <laughs> first person uh, perspective. I just can't even no, imagine no. it. It's just. No, because we, because we need to see George. We need to see yeah. him. You know, kind of like running his fingers through his hair, or, or you know, kind of like getting slapped down by something Nico says to him. You know, yeah. yeah watching his reactions is part of the fun, uh, maybe a big part of the fun, really. Oh, definitely, yes, yes. Yeah. I mean, you know, sort of like you, know, you, you can take take any film, you know, sort of like and you know where, where you have a strong lead character. You know, you'd lose so much if if that film was reshot. You know, as a first person view from that character, because you wouldn't get that character's facial expressions. You wouldn't get, you know, their body language and and so on. And I think that the same applies to games. I mean, some games you need they need to be first person, you know, because they work so much better that way. But other games, you know, I think to me, all the best adventure games are third person because we see the main character, you know. And and that's still happening now. I mean, Dave Gilbert's games are all third person, you know, and things like this and another one. You know, we like to see the characters unless we're we're playing a game where we are the character, and that's a different thing. Yeah. All right, Steve. Well, thanks for so much. I think we've learned a. Well, you certainly shared a lot. Oh, people have learned a lot. Uh, yeah. Particularly people watching this that want to do their own adventure games. I mean, a treasure trove. Of information, but you've also written a book. I want to make sure we mention that and talk about yeah. where people can get that. And also, you uh, have a couple of blogs, I think, and websites. Just basically, where do people need to go to learn more? If they went to my website, um, you know, steve ins.co.uk, um, they will, you know, find links to most of my things of one sort or another. Um, Although there isn't a link on there to my 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 revamp of Story to Nowhere, I, a few years ago I did a, a thing called Story to Nowhere, like a, a sort of comic thing. Um, but I'm I'm currently revamping that, which and that's on a site called Webtoons. Webtoons. Um, yeah. So when is that gonna? When are you expecting that to be done? Well, it's I'm I'm, I'm releasing a couple of pages, pages, <laughs> um, each week. So it's you know sort of like so an episode is is kind of like a couple of pages, effectively, um, and I'm up to episode thirty, and that'll be about sixty or seventy episodes in total, I think. Um, but that's ongoing at the moment. Um, but I'm I'm sort of like revamping the art and everything, and sort of like tweaking the text. It's a it's a bit of a sad um, story. But, uh, but people have said some nice things about it. Um, and then sad the, story the, in terms of its development, or the story itself is a sad. Yeah, the, the story itself is sad. You know, um, I won't say anything more than that. But you know, <laughs> but the um, I have to check this out. <clears throat> um, yeah, there's other things going on. There's um, obviously various game projects and stuff I can't talk about, obviously because they're they're in development. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say you you do a consultant consultancy work, right? People that 
are working on a game can come to you and hire you uh, to help oh, with yes, their scripts yes. and yes. I mean, what, what, well, that's, what, what, I mean, that's that's a key part of, of, of how I make a living. You know, it's not like people come to me and say, oh, we need a story for for our game that's going to be about, you know, dancing turtles or, or something. <laughs> that, that was just off the top of my head. I mean, I'm not really, stage of a I'm game, not really you know, working a on a game about show, that dancing doing, turtles. I got a lot of indie guys and gals that watch the show. I mean, so at what point of their project should they, would they want to consider hiring you? Well, a lot of the, a lot. Of it depends on on what they want to achieve with the consultation, shall we say? I mean, if they want if they want to, you know, maybe get some feedback on their story, say, um, then they'd probably want to do that quite early, you know, sort of when it's still at a fairly high level, you know, kind of is this is this story structure making sense? Is it, you know, can other is the motivation right and all this kind of stuff? You know, is will it work as a game story? Because people come up with great, great stories all the time, and then they struggle to kind of actually get them to, to tie into to this this game idea that they have of, you know, maybe it's a platform game. How do you deliver a, a story with a platform game? Now, it's not that that's particularly difficult in itself, um, or more difficult than any other you know game story. But it has to be delivered in in a way that 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 doesn't hold the player back from the the platform stuff which is primarily the reason that they're they presumably playing the game so i mean like an adventure game is all about story so you don't mind the fact that these characters waffle on a bit <laughs> but if that happens in a platform game or an action game then then people get bored of that quickly so you've got to be a lot tighter with your dialogue and and you've got to be sharper with your story points and and, and so on so so you need to, you need to kind of sometimes you know, an indie. I mean, they might not need to employ a writer full time, or, or to work on the full projects, but they may need feedback at key points. And it might be just be, you know, kind of like they they need me to look over something for a half a day or a day or something like this, and and they can do that. I'll, I'll charge them accordingly, and and they can then move on, as it were. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Yes, so 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 indie indie developers can can you know sort of like they don't they don't have to feel that they, they need to pay me a small fortune um, to hire me for months or weeks even um, it can just be a day here or, or you know half a day there and, and so on excuse me um, because because you know I, I fully understand that indie budgets are are obviously very limited um and uh, you know sort of like i i don't do kind of like profit sharing and i don't do you know deferred payment because that stung me a couple of times in the past yeah. <laughs> you know sort of like someone will go oh yeah you'll get a share of the profits and, go, and then the game doesn't come out so i've kind of spent <laughs> a lot of work you know and then another one is like you know deferred payment oh yeah you'll get paid when when it makes it makes some money and and it just doesn't, you know. It, ultimately, it's kind of like it leaves it leaves a bad taste, and I don't think it helps anyone. And I don't want to, you know, feel badly about anybody I, I work with. I'd rather, you know, kind of like, you know, do less but more quality work with them than than you know, sort of like feel that you know they they would need to employ me for six weeks and and then feel as though they've spent the whole budget on on just me <laughs> you know so you ever, I think, has anybody ever sent you something and it was just so bad you're like no <laughs> this is beyond even my ability um there's been a there's been an element of that sometimes you know sort of and and you know, you get people. I get people coming to me who say, "I've had a great idea. I just need you to write it for me." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and and uh, that, yeah, is, sure. that is quite deferred, funny. Pay, deferred payment, right? For that. <laughs> yeah, but uh, you know, and then I've had I've had people that have asked my advice, and when I've given them to it, you know, I've tried to be constructive and say, like, you know, sort of like this, re- this, this isn't working. Um, this character needs better motivation and all that. And then they argue with me and say, 
oh, I don't think that's right. I don't. And then, well, why did you come to me for my advice if, if you're not going to take notice of it? <laughs> I think there's a bigger problem than when that person's writing, right? It's, yeah. That, so that goes all the way back to what we were saying at the, nearly at the beginning. Just you have to be open to like people are giving you their feedback, right? And, well, that's right. Yes. And you, not really if, helpful if, if you just say, "Well, I'm, I'm just going to ignore this or get mad about." It. Yeah, there's 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 a phrase for that, isn't there? It's ask hole. <laughs> they ask advice, but then do the exact opposite. Oh, I see. <laughs> but yeah, so um, but yeah, you you've got to be open. You you got to. I mean, even if if somebody says that they hate your game or your story or whatever you, and then give genuine reasons why they do rather than just saying oh hey this is horrible if they give you genuine reasons why they dislike it then i mean that's fair they you know not everybody will have the same taste not everybody w will like something um and and you know sort of like if if their reasons are you know well laid out and and make sense then you kind of take that on board and you think, well, okay. But sometimes you've got to say, well, you know, they're obviously not my audience. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, and and you can't, ultimately, you can't please everybody. I see you all know? that and, time and, with games. I'll play a game and think, this is a wonderful game. I had a great time with this. And this, out of curiosity, I'll look at some of the reviews and you'll be reading these things and it's like the person just sat down and tried to think of every possible negative and they mm. could come up with to trash a game. And then yes. everybody kind of likes that trash, trashing, I guess, and they'll jump on board that. Yeah. Don't you, do you feel that sometimes um, if somebody doesn't really love something, they'll decide that they hate it mm -hmm. rather than going, oh, well, it's okay, you know. So it's kind of like they either love something or they hate it. Yeah. There's no middle ground for them. Um, and I think that that's a real shame. I mean, there's tons of stuff that I don't love but I still enjoy. Um, and I think that as, and, and in some, in some respects I've, I've seen this with people, you know, kind of like this, you know, they, they have, they might get three great reviews of a game and then two, two bad reviews, but those two bad reviews are way more important than the three good ones, you know, because, because it's, you know, sort of like we have seen program, you know, so I like to see that, and and I I try to be I try to look at the the good reviews and say, yeah, these people loved it. I'm doing something right. Okay, those those bad reviews, fair enough. You know, it's obviously not for them. You know, and you I think if you if you get a bit more philosophical philosophical about, um, you know the the, the your approach to criticism, I think that that you cause yourself, or yeah, cause yourself an awful lot less worry. And heartache because, as I say, you cannot please everybody, but you can still learn from from all feedback. What you've got to be wary of is if, if somebody says, "Oh, I think that you should you should make his color his hair color green or something like this," then you know that's not that's not that's just an opinion. That's not real feedback, you know. And, and you can't you can't take notice of every little thing like that. What you've got to do is you've got to take notice of the kind of general trends if everybody if, if a lot of people say they didn't like the bad guy or they didn't like the sidekick or something like this then then obviously there's something wrong with the sidekick you know or, or the bad guy you know so you've got to look at that in a in a much more general sense not oh we didn't like the bad bad i didn't like the bad guy because he wore blue shoes you know <laughs> What? <laughs> you know, so so you, you get gotta criticism be like that for the broken sword games. Like, no, I didn't like the game because of somebody's hair color or what's. <laughs> it seems well, absurd. I'm sure there's do... somebody out there that would just ruin the game for them. You know, you do get you do get some some things like that. Um, I think that 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 is possibly a bit extreme. The example, but but what I'm trying to say is that you can't get fi too fixated on every specific detail that comes back. You know, if it, you know, you've got to look at the general trend of the feedback. You know, uh, I noticed that one of my theories is with especially sites like Steam or Amazon, where the users can read the reviews and vote them up and down. 
And I think what <laughs> tends to happen is people are just more entertained uh, by the really trash talking reviews on the one hand, and they also yeah. also the the really ones that are like this is the best game ever. You know, so you usually see like the top two reviews will be like one that's just over the top, good, and then the other one is just like wow, did this person even play? Do we play the same game? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, most of the reviews would just be like yeah, it was okay, or it was fine. I think, but, yeah, yeah I think it's just been... kind of interesting to read those reviews, right? They're just yeah, they're too yeah. reasonable. I think the I think there's there's too many people who seem to go out of the way to be to be negative. I mean I, I used to enjoy listening to Yahtzee's um short pieces about various games. Um I don't know if you've ever you know, sort of like listened to any of his stuff. Um a British guy who's living in Australia and he does he did this weekly thing. Um where which started out as kind of like you know, sort of like very amusing critiques. Um, what do you call it? Zero punctuation, he called it. And, but then, you know, sort of like, it just seemed to get nastier and nastier and it just seemed to be nastiness for its own sake in the end. And I just stopped, I stopped following him. Um, you know, sort of, and it, it just seemed as though he couldn't, he couldn't look at anything without seeing the negative in it. You know, no matter how good your game is, he will he will focus on the negative, and that that just got too much for me. Uh, and I just think that you know, sort of, like, it's not constructive. You know, sort of like you can be negative and constructive, but when you're just negative to to you know, kind of like show your ability to form, you know, kind of like insulting sentences, and then. I don't know. It's, it's more about your own ego at that point, isn't it? Sorry. Coming I mean, back that's... to the chefs again, I, I think about Gordon Ramsay. You ever watch him? <laughs> like yeah, everything is like, it's a dog's dinner, or dog's breakfast, and he spits it out. And it's just like these over-the-top extreme reactions. Yeah. Like it's amusing to watch on the one hand, but on the other hand, you know he's just making out like it's worse. than it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's surely not that bad. I mean, come on. Yeah, I think I think that, that I don't know. I'm not I'm not a fan of his. I think that he is he is overly negative. I mean, I think there are a lot of you know there are a lot of ways to do it better. I know it's you know sort of like we seem to devolve into into television programs that focus on the negative as well. Yeah. You know, too much and, negativity in the world. Yeah. yeah. Well, thanks. Thanks again, Steve, for doing this interview with me. I think we've covered quite a few. Th Is there anything else, though, that we didn't cover that you think we ought to cover? Um, no. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> All right, then. Well, uh, yeah, I think, that I, you know, sort of, um, yeah, yeah. Although I will, I will say that, although you mentioned my book earlier, you know, sort of, it's probably a little, a little dated now. I mean, it did come out 12 years ago, so... <laughs> Yeah, I ought to do a Has revamp. Has it been that long? I'll yeah. Maybe, maybe that's the next project, a revamp of, of the book. Um, yeah, yeah, maybe. Well, I, I imagine it's, it's, I wouldn't think it would uh, have aged badly, right? I mean, most of the stuff oh, no, so, still apply just fine. I mean, maybe just the examples. Yeah, I mean, some some of it is, is obviously, quite a lot of it is still relevant. Yeah, it's just, it's, you know, the, it is examples. It is probably the fact that, you know, in a, in a sense, I've got. I think I've got better as a as a writer, so I'll probably approach some of those things slightly differently. Um, maybe I'd make it. I think I'd put in more examples, to be honest. Of, you know, sort of like how to approach um, writing of of characters and dialogue and so on. And would you be doing this as a as another print book, or would this be an electronic thing? Well, or? I don't know. I was thinking. You know, I was thinking of actually doing a series of articles rather than you know, um, but but I don't know whether that will will happen or not. But I also had, I quite fancied doing a book called you know like something like two hundred and one ways to become a better writer. You know, and sort of like these are all short little kind of paragraph or two paragraph snippets. You know, sort of like. Um, listen to other com other people's conversations on the bus 
<laughs> which might sound you know awful really but but it's it's listening to the way people talk i mean you only get good at writing dialogue by listening to other people talk um you know kind of like not people talking on their own like i'm doing now but you know talking to each other you know so you get you understand the rhythm of the back you know the back and forth the way that they interrupt each other the way that they anticipate each other's lines and stuff like this there's all sorts of things going on you know the the fact that you might have two two blokes talking who you know kind of like each one wanting to dominate the other in the conversation and you know and there's all sorts of things going on isn't there between characters and i think that that listening to other people is is the only way to get good at writing dialogue you got 200 other ones <laughs> That's gonna yeah, be great. I've actually, I've actually got a list of two hundred and one um, things I want to cover. It's just about finding the time to write them. Well, I hope you find the time. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll let you go so you can get started on that. <laughs> yes, don't do. So number two hundred and two is don't do too long interviews. <laughs> 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 that's all for this week. I don't know what that was. Uh, that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. It's uh, amazing to me. That I think this was something like two and a half hours uh, worth of footage here. I mean, Steve just never misses a beat. You know, I, was, I was thinking as I was editing this, a lot of these guys, I have to uh, you know, do quite a bit of editing. They'll mess up, want to repeat things, or just not really have a, an answer to questions. Uh, Steve, not like that at all. I mean, this guy's just a real pro. Uh, so I do recommend, if you are working on a game of your own and you need some help with the story uh, elements to it, I think you could do a lot worse than to hire Steve uh, and get him to consult with you. I think it would uh, really make a big difference for your game. So I'll definitely uh, recommend that. Uh, let's see what else. Oh, uh, by the way, uh, thank you very, 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 very much for your uh, support of this show, making these interviews possible. Thank you. It's completely up to you <laughs> whether uh, Match Hat continues on for another 400 episodes or, or what the uh, the future of this uh, production. It's it's all in your hands. I really depend on you guys to keep these uh, uh, episodes in production to keep the uh, these interviews coming. A lot of great stuff in the pipeline. I've got a guy uh, working on uh, Mac gaming history. I wanted to interview these guys, uh, uh, Fatbot Games, uh, the uh, Vaporum developers are uh, really really super nice guys i mean they sent me some shirts <laughs> so, <laughs> that pretty much guarantees them a spot on the show a little tip out there for you other indie devs uh let's see uh, uh, and then i've got uh, some other stuff coming up uh, uh people working with me on getting some uh, other interviews lined up so anyway there's a ton of stuff in the pipeline and uh, you make it possible so thank you uh, if for whatever crazy reason you have yet uh, to go to the link in the show notes to uh, support Matt Chat, just take a few minutes, uh, go to that Patreon site, it's completely painless, you won't even notice the uh, little bit of, a, the, what is it, a buck a show, uh, that's all I ask, you probably won't even notice that coming out of your, uh, your bank account, except for that warm and fuzzy feeling that you'll get uh, when you see the new Matt Chat episode <laughs> in your YouTube uh, box and think, well, I, uh, that's, that's my episode, and I put... Uh, put in for that. So anyway, thank you very much for that. Also for tweeting, uh, Facebooking, uh, redditing, red, redditing. I don't know what what you call that. Reddit posting. Uh, whatever it is you do, I really appreciate it. Just want to make sure that you know I appreciate you and grateful. And <laughs> thank you uh, for all that. All right. So what about that news from the Matt Cave? Oh, do I have some news for you. Uh, Stig wrote this in. This is uh, Obsidian. Uh, they have uh, decided to release uh, or announce, I guess, three uh, in-depth expansion packs for uh, Pillars of Eternity 2 Dead Fire. And they've talked a little bit about what these expansions will entail. There's uh, first one's called Beast of Winter. Uh, there's Seeker, Slayer, Survivor. Seeker, Slayer, Survivor. <laughs> it's a pretty cool name. And uh, the Forgotten Sanctum is the third one. Those are all part of this 
Uh, you can get it all uh, as part of the uh, Obsidian edition of Pillars of Eternity 2, or you can get a season three or season pass for it. And those will uh, be available for $24.99 or individually for $9.99 uh, as the game is released. And I, uh, I feel like a complete idiot here. I did not write, even write down when uh, this game is set to launch. I think it's pretty much any day now. I know a lot of you guys probably have this pre-ordered already. Uh, I'm really looking forward to it myself. But uh, I don't know what to do uh, because I've been playing... Uh, this is, by the way, the second news item. <laughs> Battletech has uh, just been released uh, a few days ago. And, I mean, this thing has just taken over my life. <laughs> just kind of, I'm glued to this thing. It's absolutely amazing. If you, if you like the XCOM-style uh, games, I, I kind of think of it as XCOM meets Crescent Inception. You know, if you remember that one from... Uh, I guess that was back in the Amiga days I was playing that. Uh, anyway, loved that uh, game back then and totally uh, into this new one here. Um, I'm only about six hours in, but I uh, <laughs> can't wait to get back to it. <laughs> and uh, I'll, I'll save the details on it. Uh, I'm not really, I don't feel prepared to write a review or anything at this moment other than I just really enjoy it. Uh, if you want it, uh, you can get it from GOG uh, for $39.99. I uh, recommend getting it from GOG. And use the uh, link, the affiliate link in the show notes, and you can uh, support the show, get a great game, uh, no additional cost. And uh, yeah, You know, you should probably be buying more of your games from GOG anyway. Uh, there are uh, no DRM on those, so you don't have to worry about not being able to load up the game at some point because the uh, Steam has decided to go away. <laughs> Who knows what could happen. And you wouldn't want to lose out. All right, then finally, this is a, a really nice uh, uh, item here. This is the Atom, A-T-O-M RPG. And it's, it's sort of a Fallout-like uh, game, I guess an homage to Fallout, uh, with a little bit of a twist. And the uh, developers actually got in touch with me, so I thought I'd read some of their, uh, their email that they sent me. And so they say, uh, this is uh, Dimitri and Anton. Uh, they say, like many other Slavic Eastern European attempts at a Fallout of our own, uh, we had a, a new spin, an original idea. Uh, what they wanted to do is take our real-life environment, where we actually lived in the 90s and early uh, 2000s, rural areas, woods, fields, poor small towns in the middle of post-Soviet nowhere. Common working-class people, grandmas, grandpas sitting on park benches, bureaucrats, common criminals, low-ranking army men, learned intellectuals, barely literate villagers, alcoholics, <laughs> shady business people, homeless guys, etc., Imagine how all these people would act in a world where bombs fell on Moscow 20 years ago. What sort of society would they create where there's no communist party to rule them, uh, no more Soviet propaganda to blindly follow, but also no Coca-Cola to teach them democracy and consumerism, no more concept of a bright future, as we call it. And I mean, if that doesn't intrigue you, I don't know what will. Uh, so if you're a big fan of, uh, like I am, of the original Fallout and Fallout 2, I actually like those a lot better than uh, the newer ones, to be uh, perfectly honest with you. Uh, I think you're really going to be uh, tuned into this. So t uh, check it out, Adam RPG. I think that's on Early Access uh, over on uh, Steam. I'm not really sure what, what it costs at the moment, but uh, anyway, uh, go check that out. Maybe I'll get these uh, developers on. I want to give the game a little spin, see what, it, see what it's all about, and then... Uh, if I like what I see, I'll have those guys on. Uh, so anyway, thank you, uh, Dimitri and Anton, uh, for that. All right. Whew, man. My throat is kind of dry. Uh, <laughs> what can I do about that? <laughs> oh, I think I know what I can do about that. I will enjoy. This is, uh, you know, quite honestly, one of the most uh, attractive... <laughs> <laughs> labels I've, I've ever seen on a bottle of alcohol. I mean, it looks like uh, artwork from some kind of uh, black metal album. I mean, it's just sort of that, that sort of Celtic vibe I'm getting from this, sort of a Viking vibe. Uh, really just sort of uh, interesting Viking, I guess, inspired artwork on this. I will show you some pictures of it uh, closer up. This is the Hammerheart Brewing Company, and these guys are out of... Uh, Minnesota. It's really, really fine print there, and I don't have the <laughs> perfect eyesight. Um, looks like it's Hammerheart, or oh, I'm sorry, uh, Lake Drive, Lino Lakes, Lino or Lino Lakes, Minnesota. So not really sure how far that is. Oh, you know what? This is really cool. They actually give the credit uh, for the art. It's the art by Tanner Anderson. 
that's a really nice touch. You know, a lot of this, uh, you know, I see, I see a lot of great uh, artwork on bottles, but a lot of times you don't even know who did it. Uh, they won't even credit the uh, the artist on that. So that's really, really super cool, I think. That's uh, so a great job, Tanner Anderson, uh, if you happen to be watching this. Well, let's see a little bit about it. They say, uh, what is it? Uh, Fimble Vetter. Uh, Fimble Vitar. <laughs> Not really sure. It's kind of runic uh, scripting on that. So looks like uh, Fimble Vetter, a oak, an oak smoked wheat double India pale ale. Oak smoked wheat <laughs> double India pale ale. Uh, that sounds really interesting. And I I'm not even really sure I've ever had an oak smoked uh, wheat <laughs> before. Uh, and what that has to do, I guess it's a wheat meets double India pale. I'm not really sure what to expect uh, from this. Uh, they say it's named after the brutal, named after the brutal winter that will destroy a third of mankind before Ragnarok in Norse mythology. Uh, Fimbleveter is a double IPA fermented with Norwegian yeast made with for the sub-zero winter temperatures in minnesota my god folks uh, this has been a pretty brutal <laughs> winter for this we still have melting snow here uh, if you can believe that uh, anyway i think this will make it all better <laughs> really eager to get into this uh thimble viter uh, thimble <laughs> i don't know <laughs> maybe a different name guys uh, but anyway really looking forward to this so let's get it open and see what it's all about all right, so I got some of this uh, Hammerheart Brewing Company's Fimble Vader here in the rather excellent drinking horn. I felt like I needed appropriate headwear <laughs> uh, for some reason. I don't know. Mm. Uh, really a uh, powerful aroma on this. <laughs> you know, I noticed there's stuff uh, floating around in this, and I think it's moving. <laughs> it seems to be. Uh, alive. Uh, I mean, that is just, it's kind of a little bit, <laughs> um, uh, shall we say, interesting. Uh, anyway, really thick, super cloudy, really sort of a, a foamy uh, top on this. Like I say, it looks almost like a, a living thing. You can definitely smell that uh, oak smoking, I guess they, they called that. Kind of a smoky aroma. I smell a lot of the wheat in here. Um, definitely smell the hops too. Just a lot going on uh, here. There's plenty to smell. You know, if you like smelling things, I think you'd really enjoy this. Uh, you know, I think I smelled this about four or five times and every time I've smelled something different. So that time I got like a, a sort of lemony, uh, citrusy aroma on it. But anyway, let's, <laughs> let's give it a taste. You know, I don't know about this. Uh, uh, there's, yeah, see, look, <laughs> it's like stuff swimming in that. Uh, I kid you not. Uh, anyway, um, other things I do. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> well, that is. Uh, <laughs> I don't know quite what to make of this. Uh, you sort—I of, got a really strong uh, that smoky flavor. I guess that's what I, I noticed right away. Smoky, a little bit of hops in there. Kind of this—I uh, don't know if this is one of those sour beers or not, but there's uh, definitely a little something unusual in, in the flavor here. I'll try it again. Yeah, it's. it's uh, <laughs> It's kind of a, a bunch of stuff going on all at once. Uh, you get that smokiness, uh, the hoppiness, uh, maybe just a little bit of a weedy flavor, but really it's, it's almost like I've just swallowed a mouthful of smoke here. <laughs> uh, sort of the, a little bit of like that bourbony flavor you get with some of the barrel aged stuff, uh, but it's very smoky uh, with a little bit of a, like a sort of a weedy aftertaste. Uh, so def you definitely notice the double India pale ale side to this which for me means it's uh, super hoppy uh, but I will say this it's not overly bitter uh, a lot of times uh, something really hoppy just kind of <laughs> makes it difficult to drink but I think they really nailed it here uh, really though the thing that stands out to me is just the thickness of this <laughs> this sale it's, it's almost like a, a milk like level of uh, creaminess to this uh, very thick I'll try it one more time here
you know, I'm starting to warm up to this. <laughs> uh, it definitely takes a little getting used to. Uh, the oak smoking is just not something I'm really uh, familiar with, but it, it really is starting to grow on me. It's got a really uh, pleasant aftertaste, kind of lingers for a while. Uh, you start to taste some of those other flavors in there. Uh, the, uh, the, wheaty, uh, the wheaty side, um, I'm not sure what kind of hops they're using here, but uh, I like the flavor and I like the fact that it's not too bitter. I'm going to give one more uh, taste on this. You know, and I'm not sure how much alcohol it has in it, but it doesn't taste especially strong. Uh, not, not any kind of alcohol fumes or anything coming off of this. <laughs> you know, I got to say, though, it's, it's really weird seeing a bunch of stuff floating around in your beer. I don't know what those are. Little bits of uh, little particles in there. <laughs> I guess those are the yeasty, that Norwegian yeast uh, floating around in this. Uh, I think it's kind of awesome, really. I mean, <laughs> if you really want to impress somebody, uh, somebody would see you drinking this and they'd be like, what the hell are you drinking? <laughs> and then you could say, oh, it's just the fimble later, right? <laughs> uh, anyway, a lot of fun with this. I'm going to go ahead and go a full five out of five drinking horns on it. Uh, probably not something you'd want to drink every day or just, uh, you know, casually. Uh, but if you want something really interesting and you like the sort of Norwegian Viking themes and you just want something really different with a lot of uh, strange stuff going on, I think you could do a lot worse uh, than this Fimblevader. Uh, really enjoying this. Uh, the first couple of swigs were kind of, uh, well, I don't want to say weird, but uh, kind of weird. <laughs> it definitely grew on me quickly and I actually really like it. So I go five out of five on this. I'd be really curious if you guys can find this, and uh, some of you guys know a lot more about beer than I do. I'd love to have your take on this. Anyway, let's uh, wrap it up with a quotation. And I was looking for quotes about criticism and feedback, and you know, it's something I have to deal with on a professional basis as a professor. You know, one of the big jobs we do is grading papers, right? So <laughs> I'm always kind of hypersensitive about uh, what I'm putting on somebody's paper. I don't want to discourage them. Uh, on the other hand, you want them to uh, listen to what you're saying and try to use it, right, to improve the, their writing. And so I, I, it's something I guess is kind of close to home for me. Plus, being a writer, you see these people that do uh, these harsh reviews sometimes, just uh, like, what the hell? <laughs> Did I injure this person in another life or something? Anyway, this brings me to the uh, quotations by Norman Vincent Peale. And I, I just really love this, uh, uh, this quotation. I think you will, too. I think it's really just a word... Uh, words to live by, right? Wisdom. It goes something like this. The trouble with most of us is that we would rather be ruined by praise than saved by criticism. I'll ponder on that. And see you guys next week. Stupid bastard, you've got no arms left. Yes, I have. Look! Just a flesh wound.